Okay, I probably don't need to say too much about the history of chatbots or the basic technology. As we all know, Joseph Weizenbaum was the first bot master, creating a Weizen in 1966, and uh, it was an inspiration for creating Alice. Um, Alice can be thought of as, as a kind of super Eliza. Eliza has about 200 patterns and responses, and Alice currently has around 120,000. But it's all the same type of um, similar stimulus. Well, kind of Alice and AIML go back to the story of Alan Turing. Alan Turing is considered by many. It's wonderful um, ability to embed videos in the presentation here. Um, we're probably all familiar with Zip's law, which basically is what makes chatbot technology possible because instead of having an astronomical number of combinations of English language and natural language sentences to deal with, um, we've got this nice distribution that shows that um, people typically say the same things over and over again or things that they've heard other people say, and we're not all uh, William Shakespeare is uttering an original line in English to make sentence. And of course, uh, Alice is a three-time uh, Logan Prize winner. I'm actually the most proudest, uh, prou and proudest of the win in two, the year 2000 because in Alan Turing's 1950 paper, he predicted that within 50 years, the machine would be able to play the imitation game. So no matter what happens, historians will always look back and check to see what happened in the year 2000. Um, okay, I think we all know what the Turing test is here. I started the Alice AI Foundation about 10 years ago as a nonprofit organization to promote the development and adoption of Alice and AI ML free software technology. And um, that sort of led to a kind of alphabet soup of different AI ML interpreters in all different languages. So um, you can find AI ML interpreters in C, um, C++, Java, Pro, Python, Ruby, just about every any language you can think of. Someone kind of implemented an AI ML interpreter. And part of the reason for that, um, I would argue, is that the, um, the AI ML language is it's minimalistic. It's, it's a very simple language. People have called it the, the assembly language of AI because there are, there are very few basic um, functions or operations. Um, so, uh, the basic unit of knowledge in AI ML is called the category, which has uh, exactly one pattern I mentioned that in, in the question um, to Vladimir, namely that um, uh, we avoid a kind of scaling problem by restricting the language to having one pattern per category. It also has some other benefits too, but primarily it, it makes it very easy to understand if you add one more unit of knowledge what the box behavior will be on top of the 10,000 units of knowledge that you want to And AIML is a kind of unusual XML language in the sense that um, at one level, it's, it's a kind of row-oriented language um, which you can display very nicely in a spreadsheet or a database or like the editor that was being created. Um, because every, every category has one pattern and one template and optionally a couple of other fields. So it's very easy to organize those in a kind of spreadsheet and that makes it easy to look at all of them. But then when you zoom in on the, on the response side, which is what we call the template, that can actually contain hierarchical XML data. It's, it's basically a mini computer program for computing the answer. So um, when you edit the templates, there needs to be a kind of a, um, a text editor or XML editor specifically for that. So a, a nice, nice AI ML editor is sort of a combination of a, of a spreadsheet and a text editor. Um, some of our more recent work, uh, I'll talk about a bit more at the end, involves a new technology called Spellbinder, which we can use to create bot content fairly rapidly by reading transcripts of conversations. And um, 
as, as an experiment while I was developing that, I, I used the um, uh, 72 episodes of the original Star Trek series to try to extract bots representing um, uh, Captain Kirk, uh, Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Spock. Um, it turns out that, well, uh, I should say that Pandora Bots is a free uh, bot hosting service. And it turns out that when we recently analyzed the activity on Pandora Bots, we found out that a significant portion of it is people creating bots in Second Life. So um, there's all kinds of interesting activity going on in Second Life and virtual worlds involving bots. What well, that's what you think of on the free bot hosting server, people have created a huge variety of really fascinating bot applications. Um, one of them is um, Tom Riddle's Magic Diary from, from Harry Potter. And what that is is a flash interface. If I click on the link here, I can show it to you just in the interest of time. Um, it's a flash interface of a kind of diary where you can uh, enter a question and then the question disappears and then the answer to the question appears like in the Perry Potter's magic diary. Um, there's another one. One uh, company that we've been working with pretty closely recently is Small Worlds. Small Worlds is a kind of uh, similar to Second Life, but lighter in the sense that you don't have to download a big program to run on your computer to access it. It's like how um, Small Worlds runs completely in your browser. So it's a slightly simplified, um, not truly three dimensional world, but um, one that seems to be growing in popularity just because it's a lot easier to use. So um, we've got bots in Small Worlds. Which are um, which appear as avatars, and then the other characters entering the, the game or the world can chat with the avatars. And a lot of interesting things happen. Like um, the the game has the concept of virtual money, which is called gold, and um, there are lots of different ways in small worlds to get gold. Um, and it's not clear when you start playing it how what all those ways are. So one thing that a lot of people try is chatting with the bot to see if the bot will give them money. And they'll have really long conversations with the bot trying every possible way of requesting the money from the bot. And um, of course, we don't know whether or not there's any money to find out. Um, and then another thing that's kind of fun is that crowds of avatars gather around the bots and, um, and just kind of um, play with it to, to, see what, to see what the bot will say. Um, we, you know, one, one thing I said in the, in the description of this conference is that we sort of reached a stage where bots have have gone into almost every ecological niche of the internet where there's any possibility of text-based communication. So, um, um, for example, we've done some messenger bots that connect to all the major um, IM services. Um, another concept which has been widely discussed over the years and implemented here is a concept that we're calling bot possession. And what that means is that it's not the possession in the sense of owning the bot, but you know, possession in the sense of a, of a horror movie where someone comes in and possesses your body. But the body that we're possessing in this case is the bot. So the idea here is that a uh, salesperson or perhaps a counselor could be reading or monitoring multiple conversations the bot is having, and then when one of the conversations looks interesting, jump in and take over the role of the bot and have a conversation um, as a, in a human-to-human -human mode. Um, we've also done, um, as others have, embedding, uh, embedding uh, our bots in blogger systems, and the micro-blogs such as Twitter. 